Games are a great medium, but lately the discussion around them has gotten toxic. You can't mention The Last of Us 2 online without someone screaming at you that enjoying the game makes you a literal terrorist or something, while someone else pipes up to announce it's their game of the year and anyone who disagrees is a moron. Cyberpunk 2077 is a game with a mixed reception, usually depending on where you play the game. This has led to bizarre accusations from console players that because they've had the entire city turn into cubes and had their system crash, the PC players expressing love for the game must be paid off. There's no way they're just having a better experience because they're on a more powerful system the game was better optimised for. It's tiring. And navigating this makes discussing games online a bit of a minefield. It's odd that something as insignificant as games can inspire such aggression and tribalism. Surely games aren't that important. The answer is, of course, games aren't that important. But it's also not fair to say that they're entirely unimportant. In fact, we've seen within the past year just how important they can be. The world has been in the grips of a global pandemic for the best part of a year now. Lockdowns, social restrictions and a general sense of isolation brought on by efforts to stem the tide have led to people not being able to see friends and loved ones, and it's been a tough time. Which is why Animal Crossing New Horizons was the most important game of 2020. Launching at the same time as the initial lockdowns in the West led many to retreat to virtual island life, and the community aspects of the game meant that people could gather with their friends and meet up in a way they couldn't do in real life anymore. This extended to other games too, and explained the phenomenal rise of Among Us after years of obscurity, and the sudden explosion in popularity for Phasmophobia, a new early access ghost hunting game. Everyone wanted an outlet to spend time with friends, and whether you're pretending to be Derek Akora or increasing suspicions around which of your friends is planning to murder you soon, games have helped people stay in touch. It's nothing new that games are capable of bringing people together. Gaming has a history of people gathering around N64s to complain about odd job, and entire friendships and relationships have been built out of communities around games like World of Warcraft. It just took a pandemic to really show off how valuable games are for this. And if you're stuck indoors, desperate to get out and see the world that's currently locked off to you, games have been a lifesaver there too. Can't hop on a plane? There's always the ability to pilot a virtual one and fly across the world, exploring the world from the freedom of the skies, even if sometimes you encounter terrifying nightmare buildings in the process. You can dash across vast open landscapes in a way that may not even be truly possible in the real world. You can explore history, or at least a highly stylized version of it, and get out into a simpler, less chaotic world. Or you can escape reality entirely by entering a world divorced from our own. The possibilities that games offer for an escape are endless, but as much as games allow us to escape our world, they increasingly are getting good at helping us understand it too. A fable inspired by Scandinavian mythology and featuring trolls and magic can still help us understand our feelings around family. A spacefaring adventure into the unknown can still feature an in-game couple who can help us reflect on our own romantic relationships. A management game about building a boat can help us process our feelings towards death. Even the silly bug game can feature characters struggling with relationship troubles, mental health issues and fears of not fitting into their community. No really, that stuff is in a game where characters have names like Befica and I don't understand it either. The way games can help us grasp our real world troubles in an environment we're much more in control of help us pick apart the issues and find solutions to transfer into reality. Which is why the tribalism around The Last of Us 2 is kinda weird, because the game is all about how tribalism and binary right and wrong thinking can lead to a long, tiring slog with no real conclusion. The game is telling us how we could perhaps do better to put our differences aside, stop the fighting and try and find our common ground. Or does everyone need to kill each other's dads before we all realise this? Please don't kill your dads, I beg of you. At their heart, games are creative. Some of the best titles out there encourage creativity in their players, and I'm not just talking about creative suites like Dreams, which absolutely wears that mantra on its sleeve of course, or even mod workshops where people can choose to turn a dragon into Thomas the Tank Engine, or replace a hulking bioweapon with a giant goose. The interactive nature of games allows us to mess around with the systems and see what crazy things we can make happen. We play them, after all. If you've ever managed an expert stealth kill run or witnessed an insane fighting game combo, 
you know exactly what I'm talking about. And all of these factors mean it's becoming increasingly necessary to open up games to a wider audience. See, games have this slightly annoying history that targeted them solely towards teenage boys, and it's a mentality that we're still struggling to shrug off to this day. But there is improvement. When one of the biggest launch titles of a next-gen console features a black lead and doesn't even make a fuss about it, then it's clear things are moving in the right direction. Admittedly, it's a black lead who was already popular thanks to the comics and movies that he'd previously appeared in, but it's still a bold move in a year featuring mass protests for racial equality. Gender options are increasingly the norm, with female leads and female options doing a lot to remind everyone that gaming is not exclusively a male hobby and despite the early marketing push, never truly was to begin with. There's increasingly a push to represent the entire gender spectrum too, with games like I Can Fell, Tell Me Why, and If Found being just three examples of critically acclaimed titles from the past year that prominently feature trans or non-binary characters. And the more this happens, the more welcoming gaming spaces become, and the more diverse and interesting games we get as a medium. And this is only a good thing. It's also encouraging to see games becoming more open to people with specific needs. More accessibility options are increasingly allowing players to tweak the experience to their specifications. Whether this is colorblind options, controller remapping, or special adaptive controllers that allow new players to experience games without physical barriers, developers are providing more ways to enjoy their creations no matter who they are. And these are options that benefit all players. Lord knows that I've enjoyed turning off button mashing QTEs simply because I dislike them as a design choice. Shadow of the Tomb Raider's custom difficulty settings were the closest I've gotten to a traditional Tomb Raider experience since the 90s. And the adjustable difficulty of The Last of Us 2 meant I was able to make the experience a marginally less miserable one. And of course PC players will tell you the joy of customizable control schemes that they've had for years, and even going back to games that don't contain a toggle for inverted camera controls feels like like a chore now. With these options becoming increasingly common, it's clear that games truly are for everyone, and we should be embracing that wholeheartedly. There's something that everyone needs to remember. In amongst the bickering and the tribalism and the console wars, every single one of us got into games for a reason. Every single one of us played games for enjoyment. We all have our own reasons for sticking with the medium, but ultimately many of us started in the same place. A child staring wide-eyed as we moved a sprite through a mass of polygons around and stared in awe at what we could do. And I think we all need to remember that feeling. That childlike wonder that came with first picking up a controller and realising what we now had in our hands. What it was like to drop a controller in terror when a T-Rex emerged around a corner, or the joy of locking a butler in a freezer, or whatever your most cherished gaming memories were. Because games are important, they are art, and like all art, they enrich us and allow us to understand the world around us better. Even more so, games let us play around with their worlds, adding extra depth to the experiences. We're in charge, and we take things at the pace we feel most comfortable with. And also, we get to be the badass that saves the world in the process. But that's why we need to drop the toxicity. Because games are too important to allow PlayStation vs Xbox to dominate the landscape, or whatever other argument we've decided to have this week. Instead, we all need to get in touch of why we fell in love with games in the first place, and celebrate what we have. And that's kind of what this is about. I want this to be the start of a push to talk up how great games are as a medium. Because games are good, actually, and we don't acknowledge that enough. So now it's over to you. How are games important to you? What gaming experiences helped shape you? Have you found solace or understanding in games? Let me know in the comments, and I'll reference some of the best ones in future videos. And if you want to continue to join me on this crusade to inject more positivity back into the gaming community, then make sure to like and subscribe for future videos on the topic. For now though, thank you for watching this, and thank you to the patrons that are on screen for helping to support the channel, and I will see you again very soon.